Tonight's program is the history of the Clark County Museum. And that history is going to tell you a story that goes all the way back to the, uh, the what, maybe the late 1960s, early 1970s. Um, we have three really good speakers. They're from the museum current staff. Um, I'm going to start with um, Donna Jolliffe. Donna Jolliffe, um, his family has been in the Las Vegas Valley since the 1930s. Um, she came to work at the, at the museum it just when it was still in the town site school. I won't say much about that because I don't want to steal her thunder, but she has some good stories to tell you. Jean Brady is the, print, is the um, president of the Museum Guild. So if you've probably seen Jean and, and uh, had the good fortune to be a part of some of the programs that she manages uh, for the museum. She has some good stories to tell us too. And last but not least, well, this is going to be the moderator of the program, and that, of course, is Mark Hall Patton. Um, I want to especially say something nice about Mark Hall Patton. I think, I think <laughs> his, we, everybody, everybody takes advantage of, of Mark. They, they, he helps everybody. He never says no. And uh, he's been especially good to the Historical Society. When um, Lou got ready to organize and start a historical society, Lou Laporta, that is, um, Mark came forward and, and just really helped, advised, and, and uh, watched out for us. When it looked like we were going to step on a hole somewhere, he, he made sure we didn't do that. And he, and he never has quit. It's been four or five years now. I think he's been the, the moderator for almost every single one of our programs. So, anyway, he's, he is a, a good man, and we really appreciate all the, the hard work he's done for us. Now, I'm going to turn the program over to, to Mark, and uh, I think you're going to really enjoy this history. Okay, I'm Mark, in case you didn't know that. Um, you know, I know sometimes I get lost in the uh, shuffle here. Um, I'm going to give you a, a, the overview of the museum's history first, and then I'm going to ask Donna to speak. Donna has the distinction of having been the longest term employee uh, in the history of the museum. She is retired now. She was smarter than me uh, because she has already retired. Um, and uh, so then she'll be speaking about uh, some of the incidents, and, and <laughs> there have been many in the history of the museum. And then we'll be hearing from uh, Jean, who has, among other things, served three times as president of the Museum Guild. She's been uh, with the Guild for 25 years now. Um, I think it's 25, is it not? Yes. Um, so she has uh, a long time with the Guild. A long time with the Guild. Um, <laughs> only seems that way, yes, I know. Um, the museum, you know, when you think of the Clark County Museum, the first thing that you might think is, why is it in Henderson? You know, a lot of times I've gotten that question. You know, it's the Clark County Museum. Why is it not in Clark County? Well, because it started here. It didn't start, it wasn't started by Clark County. It was the first conversations about starting a museum started in 1966. So you were right, late 60s. And they started between a lady named Mary Ellen Sadovich and uh, Edith Jennings Mariano, who was the daughter of Anna Roberts Parks. Anna Roberts Parks was the first female mortician in Southern Nevada. Now that doesn't have anything to do with the museum. <laughs> However, the other thing that Anna Roberts Parks was, was an inveterate collector. She loved collecting everything. And when she died, unfortunately, her family was left with a huge collection of stuff, local history stuff, rocks, minerals, 
Native American stuff, a stuffed penguin, just stuff, lots and lots of stuff. She had had a private museum, uh, just a, a building on her property with lots of stuff in it, and the family wasn't quite sure what to do with this. And this was in the early 1960s. And so Mary Ellen Sadovich, who was a local historian, was trying to figure out something to do. There were no museums in Southern Nevada at that point. And so they were looking for some entity that would be interested in starting a museum. Well, this just kind of was floating out there. This was in the early 1960s. And the private museum was broken into. And things were stolen and things were damaged. And so eventually they got to the Chamber of Commerce in Henderson. They ended up talking with the Chamber of Commerce, a fellow named Dick Pryor, who was the head of the Chamber of Commerce at the time. Anybody remember Dick? I see at least one nodding head. Lou, you must have known Dick, yes. Yeah, probably a few of you did. And others within the Chamber of Commerce said, you know, we should have a museum. That's a good idea. And so there was a start within the Chamber of Commerce, and by 1968, a museum was founded here in Henderson. Now, where are you going to put a museum? You're not going to put it on Boulder Highway. You're going to put it downtown. So where are you going to put it? In the old school. In the gymnasium. Why there? Well, it's already condemned. So what else are you going to do with it? The school district is approached, and they because you've got connections there, Glenn Taylor is involved, a number of other people are involved. They got the school district to turn the gymnasium over, and in 1968, the Southern Nevada Museum opens to the public. Edith Jennings Mariano loans the collection, part of the collection, from Anna Roberts Parks to the museum, a number of other things are brought in. There's a big opening, and the museum's in business. And so we have a museum here. By 1970, there's an understanding that this is going to keep going. This is a real museum. It's the only one we've got in southern Nevada, and Henderson has it. Not Las Vegas, not North Las Vegas, not the county. Not Laughlin, there is no Laughlin, you know. Not Searchlight, not Mesquite. No, it's in Henderson. So what are you going to do? Well, we need a director. So who are we going to hire? We hired a director from Kingman, a fellow named Roy Purcell. I hear, <laughs> I hear a number of chuckles there. Roy Purcell, who was working at the Kingman Museum, and he comes up here and he starts working in 1970 as the director of the Southern Nevada Museum. And he's a visionary director. He has an image of what he wants in the way of exhibits. He wants these exhibits to be ones that are interactive, that, that really say something sometimes kind of interestingly um, when you walk through his exhibits and I know Donna is going to talk somewhat about this he would have at one point you were walking through sand on the floor and he would bring in sand and you had a point where you were actually walking through sand you can imagine what that was like on the artifacts and at other points you were walking through rocks and there were doll portions in the cases and that sort of thing. It was an interesting display methodology. But he was also very much involved with the, the Chamber of Commerce. Now this was, at this time, the Chamber of Commerce had spun the museum off. It wasn't being run by the Chamber. But the Chamber was, was helping to work with it and they were trying to raise the money to build a building so that it could have its own building, because it knew that it couldn't stay 
in the gymnasium. And they were working with the city, and the city was willing to support it. So the city looked at what it could do, and what the city always had was land. And so the city looked at what lands they had, and what the city offered them was a failed gravel claim. Way the heck and gone out on Boulder Highway. It was 25 acres, actually it was closer to 50 acres originally. We had to give back 25 of that. But it turned out to be what we have now, about 25 acres out on Boulder Highway. It was given to the museum, the nonprofit that was there in 1971 with the understanding that the museum had to put a building out there within five years. Good idea. Now they've got the museum downtown. All of this is going on and they've got to do something with it. So Roy Purcell is trying to do fundraisers and that and the group that's running the museum and trying to do fundraisers and it's just not quite working. Remember at that point Henderson was about, I don't know, 15,000, maybe 20,000 people. You know, this was not the Henderson that we know today. And we're not talking about huge amounts of money coming in from the Strip or anywhere else. By 1974, there's no building out on that property. And the museum is looking at the fact that they're going to lose the property. It's going to go back to the city. And they hear about the fact that there's a depot, a Union Pacific depot in Boulder City. That's just sitting there. It's been closed for years. And the Union Pacific wants it gone. They're willing to give it away. And they've been trying to give it to a nonprofit in Boulder City, but there isn't any nonprofit in Boulder City that wants it. Now, there's some for profits, some businesses that want it, but they don't want to give it to a business. They want to give it to a nonprofit. No nonprofits want it. In case anybody here is from Boulder City, or if you ever talk to somebody from Boulder City and they say, oh, the museum took our depot. No, we didn't. We saved your depot, because otherwise it would have been kindling, because it was going to be bulldozed. And Roy Purcell and some of the folks from the volunteers that were working in the museum got together, went to the Union Pacific and said, if we can move it, will you give it to us? The Union Pacific said, sure, you can have it. And so they worked with a guy named Lee Sorensen. Bland Ford was the name of his company. It was the first time we ever worked with him. And he ended up becoming one of the backbones of the museum uh, for moving buildings. Moving a building is not an easy thing. This is something you have to really know about. It's an art. It's a skill. And Lee Sorensen was the one who was able to pick that building up in Boulder City, it was basically, if you know Boulder City, any, and well, let's see, anybody remember where it was in Boulder City? Okay, if you're driving into Boulder City, you know, you know where you make the left turn to go down to the dam rather than go into downtown? It was right there on that corner. So he picked it up, put it on wheels, dragged it from there through Railroad Pass, round and over to where the property is, where the museum is today, just down the hill here. Unfortunately, where our property is, there was no road out onto our property. There was no nice graded road. So he had to scrape a road, and it just scraped a little diagonal path, and ran it in there, if you ever wonder why, if you go to the museum, you ever wonder why the, the depot doesn't match up with any of the other buildings there, it's because the depot is on a north-south axis. You can tell north-south on, on our property if you look at the depot, because that's how he set it down. Everything else isn't. 
But that was the first building there. So in 1974, we finally got a building there. We kept the property. Thank you, Henderson. He didn't get the property back. You know, and we got the, the property there. We had a big celebration, had a party in the building, and then we closed the door and went back downtown and ran the museum down there. We didn't even clean out the trash. We left the trash inside. You know, let a guy move his trailer onto the property so we'd have some security out there. But for the next few years, we had the depot there, we had the property, but we were still running the museum because we didn't have any money. 1975, the little group that had been running the museum, well, in 74, I should say, the other thing that happened in 1974 was Roy Purcell resigned and left. So we didn't have a director. We did have a lady named Marge Ivory. Marge Ivory had been with the museum already. And she lived near the museum and she was willing to stay on. She was named manager for a year and then she was named director. It was a nice thing to do to her. She was given a nice title. She was basically a volunteer most of that time. She wasn't paid for much of that time. But she was the director then for a number of years. She was our second director. Very important because she kept the museum open. Without her, we would have closed. But we kept going. So we had the building. And in 75, we had the group that became the Guild. And the Guild, which is the one that Jean will be talking about, but I'm going to steal a little bit of her thunder, because the Guild got started to run the museum, to raise the money to try to actually operate the museum. Wonderful idea. Heck of a lot of work. And that was nice. But you know, by 1978, the city of Henderson said, you guys have to move out of the gymnasium. Anybody remember where the gymnasium was? Yeah, it's where City Hall is. Somehow the city wanted to use that property. Really? A city hall is more important than our museum? I'm sorry, I think that's a little wrong. But okay, fine, if you're going to be that way about it. So we have to move. Well, we're going to have to move out there. The guild is not finding it possible to raise the money to run the museum. The museum's looking at closing again. We got to do something. Thankfully, we had a county commissioner by the name of Robert Broadbent. Anybody remember him? I hope so. Yeah. Well, Robert Broadbent did not want to see the museum close. So he started politicking within the county, and he started pushing the county to take over the museum. And he pushed the county to take the museum and put it under Clark County Parks and Recreation. Make it a part of that. Now that meant that the county was going to take on, in perpetuity, the funding of the museum, museum staff, maintenance, collections, all of that. This is a huge amount of money. This is a huge investment. But Broadbent didn't care. He thought that this museum should exist and he was going to make darn sure it did. And he did. The Guild was all right with that. They were willing to see it because they wanted the museum to exist as well. City of Henderson was fine. They said, all right, we will support that by not trying to take back the land so long as it continues as a museum site. And we became the Clark County Southern Nevada Museum in March of 1979. Moved everything out of the gymnasium, moved it out to the museum, and we had a museum out on Boulder Highway. Didn't really have a good road to it. Didn't have any signs. 
didn't really have a whole lot else going on out there. Didn't really quite know what we were going to be. Later on in 1979, there was a family in Las Vegas that had a building that they were trying to save, but they couldn't save it where it was. It was on 4th Street in Las Vegas. It was called the Beckley House, Will and Leva Beckley's home. And Leva Beckley had finally moved out of the house. Beckley's had been trying to give the house to various different groups to move it, to save it somewhere in Las Vegas, somewhere down in that area. Nobody would take it, nobody would save it, nobody would restore it. They finally heard about the museum and they offered it to the museum. Well, we had no place for offices and no place for our staff. Not much of a staff, but we had no place for it, even so. So we said, okay, we'll take it. And so the Beckley House was moved out to the museum site. You would think, oh, okay, you bring out the house, you put it down, and you open the front door, and you start working in there, right? No. 1979, the building's moved out. It's not open to the public until 1983. This is something that you will see as an ongoing part of what we do. You can't pick up a building, move it somewhere, set it back down, and open the door. It takes a lot of money to pick it up and move it and set it down. It takes a whole lot more money to put it back together, to restore it, to renovate it, and even more money to put the exhibits inside of it. And so that's what we've done all the way through. And then once you've done all of that, it's still a house. You've got to take care of it for the rest of its existence. Think of what you put into your own houses. I've got 20 of them. Now, didn't have it at that point. So we got the Beckley House. We still didn't know quite what we were going to be, but we got the Beckley House out there. We were part of the county, and that was great. Now what are we going to do? Well, we're starting to do exhibits out there. We're trying to do something. 1981, we were approached about some buildings that are still existing from the last frontier village. Anybody remember the last frontier village? Okay. Those were down on the strip. Those were the ones that Dobie Dock used to go around into various ghost towns and that and just kind of pick up and take away with him. Uh, sometimes he would buy them. A lot of times he wouldn't. Um, if he liked a building, he had a big flatbed, he'd just take it. Um, you know, when they got rid of the last frontier village, he took some to his place down on the strip. His, his yard, well, it wasn't on the strip, it was just off the strip, but a lot of them ended up out at the uh, casino, uh, Fort Lucinda it was called at the time, out by the dam. And they were just sitting there slowly rotting. And eventually the ones that could be moved, there were a couple of them, were moved out to the museum in 1981. That was the Tuscarora Jail the Lamoille Toll Cabin, and the building that had actually been built for the Last Frontier Village, that was the sweet shop, and those we still have. They were brought out, and that was sort of created as the ghost town that we still have out at the museum. So we had the depot, and we had kind of a ghost town area, and then we had the Beckley House, and sort of, okay, now what... What are we going to become as a museum? We're still not quite sure what we're being here as a museum. And then the next thing that happened, 1982, was what really kind of defined what direction we were going. And that's when a little house, a three-bedroom house at 302 West Basic, um, got moved out to the museum. It was a townsite house. And that one was brought out, and that sort of shoehorned or, or set up what became Heritage Street. And that set up the fact that we were going to have these historic structures. 
We were going to have that street there. And we were going to be a place where not only were you going to have historical exhibits and all of that, but you were also going to have historic structures that were going to be restored that you could walk through and see how people lived. And so that was brought out. It was restored over a number of years. The main restoration took three years. It was mainly funded by the guild. Um, and I still thank the guild for that. The next big um, building built on the um, uh, Heritage Street was the Don Reynolds print shop. I have to give Donna credit for that. That was actually built there. She designed it. You didn't, you didn't realize that you're in the presence of an architect as well. Uh, I don't think Donna realized that she was in the presence of an architect, uh, but she was the one that designed that building. And interestingly enough, Don Reynolds actually came out to that, de that uh, uh, dedication. But um, that, that one was a, a modern building. Uh, at that point, our director was a guy named Buzz Nolan, Bernard C. Buzz Nolan. What can I say about Buzz? Not a lot nice. Um, I don't know whether any of you knew Buzz. I can tell you this. Buzz, in his life, before he was the, the director of the museum, had been an auditor for the IRS. And he enjoyed himself. That tells you a lot about Buzz. I interviewed Buzz at the, uh, towards the end of his life, and I can tell you he was not the most pleasant character, but he was one that did believe in the museum, and I will give him a lot of credit for that. Uh, he came in in 79 as, as the director, and he was there until 84 as the director. But he was not a very pleasant person. However, he wanted it to be an old-timey Western kind of thing. So that's why the look of the uh, print shop is what it is. Um, however, that has the uh, printing presses and that from the Henderson Home News, isn't it? Yes. There you go. The other thing, the other building that came in in 1983 was the Gumond House. It was also known as the Heritage House. Now this one was moved out to the museum. It was opened in 1999. Moved in 1983, opened in 1999. 16 years. When you work in the museum field, you take a long range view. You may have something and your point about having it is that you are preserving it. You don't always have all the money you want. I have yet to know any museum outside of the J. Paul Getty that has too much money and too little sense. And I, I can tell you of all the museums I've run in 42 years of running museums, I've never had one that had too much money and too little sense. So. This is not unusual. We, we will take buildings in some cases, and it will take many, many years. You'll hear about a couple of them as we go along in this little soliloquy here. But it did get restored, and it is open to the public. And it is restored to 1959. When you walk through the Gumond House, many of you will look at it and say, oh my goodness, I grew up in this house. I know I do every time. Now, in 1984, Mark Rosinski became the director of the museum. Many of you might remember Mark. That's the other Mark. You know, I always like to point out he was the Mark that was directing the county museum when I started here. Um, he had actually started in 1981 as the curator of education, but he became the director when Buzz Nolan retired. 1984 was also when we got the locomotive out there, the 4442. That was the one that used to be downtown at Fantasy Park. Anybody remember Fantasy Park? Okay. 
as far as I can tell, now that, that locomotive was given to Fantasy Park, to the city of Las Vegas, by the Union Pacific. And as far as I can tell, the only reason they gave that locomotive to Fantasy Park was for children to climb on and fall off of. Because nearly everybody I've ever met who grew up here climbed on that and fell off of it. I think I've met two people who did not fall off of it at one point or another. But I will tell you that when that was moved out here, it was, it was offered to the museum and we said, okay, but we can't move it. And so they said, don't worry, we'll get the, the um, tank hauling unit, the Army National Guard unit that hauls tanks around. And they said, yeah, that's a good idea. That's a great exercise. We'll come over there and our guys will do that. <laughs> and so they brought out a flatbed and they brought out a couple of cranes and a bunch of their guys. <laughs> so they brought out the cranes and they picked up that engine and they set it down on the flatbed and they blew out all the tires. <laughs> and they sat there and they scratched their heads and they said, let's think about this again. And they realized that they were going to have to nearly flatten all the tires and move that at about a half a mile an hour in order to not flatten the tires. That engine is a lot heavier than an M1 Abrams tank. So, but it's still there, and it's not moving. 1985, we got the Giles Barkas house. It opened in 1992. In 1987, we got the Babcock and Wilcox house. That's the one from Boulder City. That one we got, and, in, and I should point out, in all of these cases, we have only taken buildings where, one, we needed the building for a particular time period that we could interpret, and we needed it for that interpretation, and two, the building was going to be demolished in place. We will not take a building, and we have never taken a building that could be saved where it was. That is not the point of having them at the museum. We have been offered many buildings that we have turned down. We do not have the money to take everybody's old building. And we don't want a building just because you want your land cleared. Sorry, that's not our business. We only want the ones that we have needed for the interpretive value for what we do for the community. You know, we've taken in the, the motor court cabin in 87, and in 88, we reached out and created the museum down in Searchlight. That was our first outreach museum. So now, all of a sudden, we've got the museum here on Boulder Highway, and we've got one 30 miles or 35 miles south of here in Searchlight. And that's before it was a four-lane road. That's when it was Blood Alley going back and forth down there. And Donna can speak to that because she was the one that did that museum as well. One of the things you have to understand with all of our museums is the same staff runs all the museums. So when those exhibits were done, she's the one that did them. So okay, we've got that one going. In 1989, the county finally said, you know, I think you guys need an exhibit building. Yeah. Now, this is before my time, but it's still a good thing. So they gave us the money for half of an exhibit building. We designed one, and they, they actually gave us the money for the whole building, but then they kind of cut that budget in half, and we got... The, the exhibit building that we've got now, which is half of what was designed, but that's fine. It's 8,000 square feet. We're still happy with it. And that's the one that we've got. It opened in 1990. So we've got the exhibit building there. Moved in um, in 1993, something that I'm very happy with. We started the McCarran Aviation Heritage Museum. And they were the smartest people in the world because they hired a museum director from San Luis Obispo, California to start that museum. That means they hired me. <laughs> so I came over and I was the museum administrator for the McCarran Aviation Heritage Museum. That's the museum that's in McCarran International Airport. So I was working out of the museum here 
but not running this museum. I was running that museum. Now, if you don't think that was confusing, think about it. You called a museum. Say, I want to talk to the guy who runs the museum. Which one? The, the, the guy that's in charge. Right. Which one? Uh, I think his name is Mark. Right. Which one? <laughs> it got very confusing. So we've got Mark Rosinski, who's running the county museum, and Mark Hall Patton, who's running the aviation museum. We've got a staff. We want to make it even more confusing. We've got a staff where the collection staff works for me and is being paid out of my budget. The exhibit and education staff works for Mark R and is being paid out of his budget. But they do the same job for both museums. And you want to try to figure that one out? You know, trust me. We, we did a long-range plan at one point. The people doing the plan could not figure out how we worked. But it worked just fine. Mark and I got along just fine. We continued, though, at the County Museum to grow. We added the uh, Guild Gazebo in 1994, added the Guild Grove in 2000. Uh, in 2001, we actually finally shortened the name from the uh, Clark County Heritage Museum to the Clark County Museum. If you see people using Heritage Museum, no, we're just the Clark County Museum. Please tell them that. I've, I'm still trying to get the county to figure that one out. I don't understand, but it's just the county. And we have continued to add pieces. The Spartan Ed trailer was moved in in 2001. The building that the Guild is working on currently. The Grand Canyon Airlines ticketing office Bradley House was moved to the museum in 2001. We are hoping to have that restored and open to the public this summer. It will be 18 years. It takes time sometime, and I'm hoping that Jean will say a few words about that one. Oh, okay, then I will go ahead and do that. I'll, I just have to say, because it's an important building, it, it, is, it was the... the Grand Canyon Airlines ticketing office, it was also used as TWA at Bullock Field in, in Boulder City in the mid-1930s. TWA used it in 1938 when they started flying into Boulder City. They then built the ticketing office that became the Elks Lodge that's still in Boulder City today. It was then moved up into Boulder City in 1940 and became the home of the Bradley family. Wouldn't mean anything except that the Bradleys were the first black family that was allowed to live in Boulder City. Boulder City was the first segregated community in southern Nevada. Thank you, federal government. It was a federal reservation. It didn't fall under city law, county law, or state law. It was a federal reservation. And it was absolutely segregated. If you were black, you were not allowed to live there. And the only reason the Bradleys lived there was because Roxy Ruxtell, who owned the Boulder Dam Hotel, had the concessions at Lake Mead, had Grand Canyon Airlines, and he told Sims Ely, these guys work for me and they're going to live here. And Sims Ely said, no, they're not. He said, oh, yes, they are. And they did. And he broke the color barrier there. So this was their house. Now, they built a, a much nicer house a, ne a year or two later. This was the first house they lived in. And so we have saved it. And the guild has raised the money, $250,000, to restore this. Construction and restoration work should be starting within the next couple of weeks or a month, something like that. Yeah. And so we're hoping to have the, the um, opening of that sometime in June or July this year. We're looking forward to that. So anyways, we've got that here. We moved the railroad cottage to the museum. Trust me, you don't want to move a railroad cottage. Those things are concrete. Concrete doesn't move well. But we got it out there, got it restored. It moved it in 2002, opened it in 2013. 11 years on that one. But the Esslinger Barn, we moved it in 2002, opened it in 2002. 
How could we do that? It's a barn. It's a big open space. That one was easy. Sometimes they are, sometimes they aren't. Uh, we added the Mojave Gardens, the outdoor classroom as we call it. That was one that was an, out, uh, an, an area, different kind of interpretive area. We keep adding things to the museum. The Candlelight Wedding Chapel moved to the museum in 2007, opened that in 2009. Now, do we do weddings? No! Please don't ask me. I hate weddings. I loved my own. I've been married 40 years. That's a good thing. But you can't get married in the wedding chapel. We can't even let you get inside of it. You can get in the foyer, but you can't get past that. You know, that's, that's because that, the Save Henderson doesn't let us let you into that portion. And that's okay. We got it restored. That building still holds the record for the largest number of weddings in a single day. Anybody want to guess? What? Why? Why? Happened to be the, the only one that was offering free limo rides, an 800 number, all, uh, kickbacks to the, the limo drivers, all kinds of things. But the number is 425 weddings on February 14, 1989, between 6 a.m. and midnight, one lady did all of those weddings. And it works out to two and a half minutes a wedding, counting walking time. The most meaningful two and a half minutes in a lot of lives, I'm sure. <laughs> so in 2007, um, late 2007, uh, we also had another retirement. Mark Grzynski retired. The county was kind enough to come to me and say, we're going to give you another job. We're going to give you the county museum and the Searchlight Museum in addition to what is now called the Howard W. Cannon Aviation Museum. So you get to have two full-time jobs. But don't worry, we're not going to give you any more money. So it won't affect your taxes. So since December of 2007, I have been the director of all three county museums. Uh -huh. um, so I've been doing that. 2009, we took the lead in the county centennial. That was fun. That's also when Pawn Stars happened and all of that. So life got really weird at the museum. We installed the air raid siren in 2011 added the Bishop Ranch Milk House, um, and have been celebrating the 50th anniversary of the museum this year. So we've had quite, or last year, I'm sorry, last year, we've had quite a lot going on, and this year we are going to be finishing up the restoration of the Grand Canyon Airlines ticketing office, and because of the reality of getting the uh, uh, how we mourn collection from the memorials out on Las Vegas Boulevard. The over 18,000 artifacts that came from those. We also got the money to build a new storage building. So we are going to be adding that to the museum. And um, hopefully by the end of this year, we will have that opening as well. We have been out of space for uh, collections. We figure conservatively that we have a million artifacts in the museum collections between the three museums that we run in five locations with a sixth outreach in the Moapa Valley. Uh, so it's probably time to get a new storage building. That's not an unusual problem in the museum field or libraries or a number of other kinds of things like that. So that gives you sort of a quick overview of what has gone into creating the Clark County Museum system and the Clark County Museum here. But you understand, we're here because it was Henderson that started the museum. That's why we're part of Henderson. That's how we got started here. So I'm now going to turn this over to Donna, who was an integral part of an amazing part, an amazing length of the history here. 
Um, so, Donna? Can you hear me now? <laughs> well, growing up in the Las Vegas Valley, I kind of had a liking for history, let's just say that. And so on days when my mom wasn't doing anything and I wasn't doing anything, we'd get in the car and we'd come out and we'd go to the museum. And it was always fun. We'd go around and look. And every time that I looked, I'd keep going, eh, maybe some of the artifacts in the cases are getting a little dusty. And so one day I kind of got the nerve and, and Marge Ivory was, uh, this was 1975 and Marge Ivory was the director there and, and I went up to her and I says, hi, my name's Donna Olson and uh, I'm an artist, and I love the museum, but I think some of your artifacts are dusty. And I'd be glad to clean them for you, and I have experience in doing that, if you'd let me do it. And she said, well, okay. Go ahead and get into one of the cases and clean the artifacts, but you have to put everything back exactly where it was, because that's the way Roy had done it and they wanted to keep it that way. I said, fine, I can do that. Then when I went behind how you had to get into the exhibit cases, and it wasn't from the front, you had to go around behind a wall, and there was some really creepy things back there, bugs and spider webs and stuff stored back there. I discovered why nobody got in there and cleaned because the cases were nailed into the false wall with nails that were about this long. I went, oh goodness. So I got a hammer and <coughs> and I got one of the cases open, carefully moved it out, carefully got everything out, cleaned it up, put it back, washed the glass on the inside, put it back together and went to Marge and said, come take a look, see what you think. She looked at it and went, whoa, what a difference. And so she goes, you have a job. And that's how I started at the museum, cleaning cases, yes. I got into every case, cleaned everything up, and I mean, it really did make a difference. And it was really funny because I had to do it on a day when it was like sunny because a rainy day, that's when we got most people in. So here I am, and I'm thinking to myself, you know, maybe some of the artifacts aren't being cared for quite the way they should be in the case. So when I'd get in to clean, I'd kind of move things around sneakily. Nobody ever noticed that I was moving things around. Everybody go, wow, everything looks really good. Yeah, I think so. And you heard Mark talk about the dirt on the floor. And I mean, the idea of immersion into the history is a good thing. But when you're walking over rocks and you don't walk well, I noticed people had a real hard time. And it, it didn't work well at all for anybody with a cane or especially a wheelchair. And when you got to the blow sand, it was about five inches deep. And it was underneath a parachute, so it was supposed to look like underneath a wagon. You can imagine what the dirt was doing, going up and hitting the top of the parachute and coming down and going all around the whole museum. And the floor was painted black after you got out of the dirt. <laughs> so you can imagine the footprints that were all over the black floor. I was constantly cleaning the floor. So one day, I just said, dirt's got to go. So we took the dirt out of there. And the floor underneath was brown, looked good. We painted it, kind of looked like dirt, worked better than dirt. 
some of the other things that were were kind of interesting and and I mean Marge because it was largely just Marge and I that were there you know if it was lunchtime you locked the door and you went over to uh, El Dorado Club and they'd give us a free lunch but one day I came in and Marge wasn't there anymore and there was a guy back there and he looked at me and he says well, who are you? And I said, who are you? And it was Buzz Nolan. And so uh, he goes, you've been working here? And I said, yeah, I'm the one that kind of cleans everything up and takes care of stuff. He goes, you want a job? Because I've just been a volunteer. I went, that would be nice. <laughs> so that's when I first started getting paid. And I mean, it wasn't like a real paid job, but I started getting paid. And that was about the time that Buzz said, you know, we got to get out of this building. And we got to get out onto Boulder Highway. And so he drove me out to the location. Now, if you've gone out there, the street before Museum Drive is equestrian. That's the way you used to have to come in, on equestrian. And then there was a dirt road that came in to the depot. And the depot was going to become the exhibit hall. So we went out there, and Mark talked about the uh, night watchman, caretaker, and I was trying to remember his name. He invented the double bubble stuffer. His name was Wayne. I never knew his last name. I don't know whatever became of Wayne, but uh, he always watched the building. But, yeah, we, we opened the building up, and Mark was right. There was <laughs> garbage from the opening from many years before. But we cleaned it up. We didn't have any money, so it saw horses, plywood, burlap, whatever would work. And we moved the collection out there. Oh, and the, the county hired a group of people to make a, a tally of what we were moving up there. Don't ever look to that to find out what something really was. It had a number on it, and it says book. What kind of a book? Book. Rock. <laughs> Basket. <laughs> so not a very good inventory. We still have it. It's, it. That should be archived for sure. But we got everything out there in a tin storage shed because we, we knew that uh, we had to get out of the, the building downtown. And I really wanted to bring a lot of Roy's artwork out because he'd done some beautiful artwork in there. Well, remember the big nails I told you that he used to put the cases in? That's what he used to put the plywood up with. And then he put a wash of plaster over it. I would have loved to have saved most of that, but when you took the nails out, the plaster popped off and there went the artwork. We were able to save the mosaic that was at the very end exhibit. That was an interesting exhibit. That's the one that had the half mannequin with the steering wheel stuck in its neck. But the, that's, that got saved. Um, a couple of others that I was able to save portions of them. You know, and Roy came to me later and he says, why didn't you save all that? And I said, if you'd used smaller nails, I probably could have. But, you know, it's, it's, it's a good thing there's a lot of photographs of that because we just could not save that artwork. So here we are out on Boulder Highway. <laughs> if you can imagine the closest thing to us, well, Palm Mortuary was there. I think the 7-Eleven was on the corner. There wasn't anything else out there but us. And, well, the dog racetrack was there. Yeah, well, you could hear the dogs barking. And... Uh, so Buzz and I were sitting there one day, and this big old storm came in, and we're watching it come in. The flagpole was attached to the building, and all of a sudden, bam! Lightning hit the flagpole. Every socket in the building was popping, and, and we both looked at each other and said, the flagpole's getting moved tomorrow. <laughs> and it did. It got moved away from the building. And like Mark said, when uh, the Beckley house came out, we're, we're sitting there, we're kind of going, 
what are we going to do out here? We have a historic depot. We've got this great house. And that's when we came up with the idea for Heritage Street. Hey, you know, this could be a cool thing. Saving buildings that are going to be torn down. I mean, if we don't, they're gone. And I mean, I remember going by the Beckley house with Mrs. Beckley sitting on the front porch. It was 120 South 4th Street. I mean, it was between two big buildings there. And I, I thought to myself, that would be really cool. It'd be something that nobody else is doing, is to save some of these buildings. Um, and Mark talked about how houses look when you get them out there. Well, lath and plaster, when you move it, it cracks big time, and big chunks of it will come down. And uh, I remember it was $10,000 to move that house out there and 60000 to fix it back up compared to $250,000 today. Uh, the Junior League of Las Vegas actually gave us quite a bit of money for that one. And um, Bruce Beckley and Virginia were really great. I mean, they gave us almost everything that's in there as original to the house, even some of the paintings on the wall. I mean, it's, it's really great. And yes, I am going to tell them about the butt print on the bed. <laughs> I'm one of those people that you kind of figure if somebody can imprint on something after they've lived in a house for 60 years, somebody did in that one. With all the original furnishings in that house, I'd lock up the house at night, and nobody else was out there. And when I'd come in in the morning, there was a butt print on the bed, like somebody had been sitting there. Seriously. And I'd go, okay. And I'd straighten it out. You'd lock it up at night. You'd come in the next day, and there was the butt print on the bed again. And I went, oh, well. Maybe somebody really did come with the house besides the furniture. I mean, we actually did have a paranormal group come out. And uh, they went in the house in two separate groups. The first group that went in, when they got in the bedroom, every battery and every piece of equipment they had went dead. <laughs> the next group that came in, Cameras kept taking pictures with nobody taking the pictures. So if there's something out there, <laughs> Beckley House, and you know, it's, it's funny, over time it got less and less and less and less. And I just kept saying, well, I guess they're used to it being an exhibit and they're not worried about it now. The Gaumont House, I don't like what's in there. <laughs> that one's got a problem too. That house actually came out in two parts. The carport had to come, and all the rock had to come numbered so we could put it back again the way it was. And uh, we had the Plymouth was actually in the carport, and we had a big wind come, and it blew the carport down on the Plymouth. Now, if it had been a modern-day car, there wouldn't be anything left of that. It kind of put a dent in the roof of the Plymouth. The carport came down. So these are some of the, the odd things that happen there at houses. <laughs> and when I was decorating the houses, I didn't want them to look like model homes. I wanted them to look like somebody actually lived there. So like the townsite house... Oh, well, there's a cute story about that one. Where it came from, it was up and ready to move, and the owner was already building the apartment building on the property right behind it. Again, a big wind came along. Guess what blew down? Not the townsite house. The apartment building blew down. <laughs> so it kind of speaks well of the townsite house. When it got out there, um, it had been modified quite a bit. It took, well, the Henderson Fire Department, when they were going to burn one down, they would call us and say, come get stuff. 
So it's got parts of seven other townsite houses to make it look like it did originally because a lot of it was missing when we got that house. So seven other townsite houses live in that particular house. Uh, let's see some other interesting stories. Now, oh, the Spartanet trailer. Uh, I don't know if any of you knew the Golden Rule trailer park that was down in Pittman off of Corn Street. It was uh, Mrs. Corn had it. Well, her daughter gave us a call one day and she said, we're getting rid of the trailer park, come down and get some things. And we're getting some clothing and a few books and things like that. And she goes, anything else you want? And I said, I want that trailer. She said, it doesn't have any wheels on it. It's got flat tires. If you can get it out of here, you can have it. Be careful what you ask for. So my husband and my brother-in-law jacked up one side of it. I took the rim off, took it down to Haven's Tire, got a tire, put it back on, jacked up the other side, took that off, took it down to Haven's, got a tire, put that on, and I called a tow company. I said, we're going to need a flatbed and something to haul it out of where it is. I don't know how good the axles are on it. So they did. They came and they pulled it out, put it on the flatbed, took it up there, and I looked at them and I says, please be kind because I'm paying for it myself. And they said, we're good. Wonderful. Wonderful people. And uh, when it had to be moved where it's sitting now, uh, we hooked onto it with our big four-wheel drive truck. I will say this, that Spartanet trailer is, I would love to have it. You can't even tell it's behind there. It's a wonderfully balanced trailer. So I'm driving it around the parking lot, and I come in behind the print shop, and I'm trying to get it back, and I'm kind of out on Heritage Street, and I'm backing it up, and I'm trying to remember, hold the bottom of the wheel so you're turning it the right way. And my helper, David, he's going, turn the wheel, Lucy, the other way. <laughs> so that got in there. Um, I think my husband wanted me to tell the story about the, uh, the Halloween coyote. <laughs> it was Halloween, and some visitors came in and said, Boy, that fake coyote you've got out in the Guild Grove really looks real. And I went, fake coyote? <laughs> so we went out there, and the poor thing. Uh, animals like to come into the museum and die. I guess they feel safe there. The poor thing. He was old, and he had died. So my husband and I had to give him a decent burial. But, uh, yeah, poor thing. And the, the story of the print shop, yes, Mark was right. Uh, somebody told us that Don Reynolds never went to anything that he gave money for. He just didn't. But I'll be darned, he showed up, his limo brought him right up in front of the print shop. He got out, he loved the print shop, had a piece of cake, took the model I made, and left. <laughs> But Don Reynolds showed up for that exhibit opening. That was great. Yeah, all the equipment in there did come from the Henderson Home News. Trying to think of maybe... Back in the, the, the old museum, when I, when I first uh, was kind of poking around there, there was a big stage and it had curtains and stuff. A lot of the collection was stored up on the stage. That was kind of a, a spooky place to be. But uh, I got into a cupboard and there was a big garbage bag and I opened up the garbage bag and lo and behold, inside there were the most fantastic southern Paiute baskets I had ever seen in my life. They were all just kind of piled in this black plastic bag. You'll get to see some of them in the upcoming exhibit that opens on April 5th. <laughs> um, 
they had come from the Southern Nevada Historical Society. They were actually on loan until the Historical Society um, disbanded, and then they gave them to the museum. But they belonged to a guy named Owen Poff, who had collected them in the early 1900s. I have never seen anything quite as pretty as those baskets there. But, but that was kind of, you know, when you're poking around and looking through things and you're trying to take the best care that you can of artifacts. And, I mean, we didn't have archival boxes. We didn't have the money to buy a lot of that stuff. So I'm trying to take care of this stuff the best you can. And when it got moved out to the... Um, the new site of the museum, I remember that there were some county personnel and I kept telling them, don't throw it off the back of the truck. And sure enough, one of the big gemstones went right off the back of the truck and broke. So it was like, I followed them like a hawk down to the old museum and back again and down to the old museum and back again. I made sure nothing else got broke. And boy, when they were going to build that new building, I mean, I was just thrilled to death. I mean, the depot was okay, but uh, we didn't have central heat and air. We had uh, oil heaters in the wintertime. You can, I don't know if you've ever smelled what oil heaters smell like after you turn them off. It's bleh. Every night you'd have to go turn them off, make sure they were out. I mean, you don't want to set the depot on fire. In the summertime, we had this giant cooler that leaked water everywhere. And, I mean, I felt bad for some of our visitors. <laughs> I even felt like, well, they're really getting a good feeling of what it was like in the early days. Because I asked my mom, I said, what did you guys do when it was hot in the summer when you went to bed? She says, we wet the sheets. You slept in wet sheets. So I guess that's, you got the feeling when you went to the museum. We finally did get a propane heater and, and a few other things, but boy, when that new building was going to be built, I thought, wow, this is great. And like Mark says, yeah, we got half the building, and the building got built, but guess what? There wasn't any money for building exhibits. So you got a nice, big, empty building. What are we going to do? And so we approached a bunch of the mining companies, and they ended up giving us the money to build the exhibits in there. And uh, if you've been in there, you see the Jelly Bean Mine. The reason it's called Jelly Bean is because the electrical for the cases that are in there, you have to go through the top of the mine and go down behind the wall. Well, you've got to be little, really tiny to get back there. So we had a, a gal that worked at the museum, Jill Heckendorf, and she was tiny enough to get back there. She got herself caught on a nail that was back there and kind of got poked pretty good. So that's why it's called the Jelly Bean Mine, because she hurt herself in there. I mean, there's a lot of, uh, I guess what you'd say, personal. I mean, it's really personal to me. You think of building a model, and I think I had life-size models to play with. I mean, decorating the houses and finding things that worked in there. For example, the Gaumont house. I knew what kind of sofa I wanted in there. You think anybody would donate that kind of a sofa? No. So I would hit the thrift stores. And boy, I'll tell you what, I, I went down to Salvation Army one day and they had that sofa there. It was orange, wrong color. It was $5. So boy, that went in the back of the truck. We got it reupholstered. But I mean, I was hitting thrift stores constantly, trying to find every little thing that you could to make it look like somebody actually lived there. If you go in the Goman house, look at the phone number on the phone. That was... Mr. Goldman's phone number. Thank goodness for phone books, which are, yeah, they're extinct now. Because without that, we couldn't find a lot of that stuff. Um, and I mean, the collection, yeah, you're doing a lot of stuff digitally. 
But everybody always says, keep a hard copy. You don't know what's going to happen. So there's hard copies of everything. A lot of times those early books, because so many different people were checking things in, you can, I'd go, oh, yeah, that's so-and-so, that's so-and-so. You can't read her writing. Yeah, I can kind of decipher this for you. I mean, I'm still getting calls. Donna, we know you know. <laughs> Come out here. <laughs> so, uh, Any questions about something you might have seen out there? Okay. I'm going to start off talking about Donna because it's not on my agenda, but in listening to her, I obviously, as Mark said, I've been there 25 years. Donna and I probably didn't talk for the first 10 years. She, every time I went by and said hello, she would just kind of duck her head. She was that shy. And it wasn't, because I went off and thought, wonder what I did to her. wonder why she doesn't want to talk to me. I mean, I was there a lot. I mean, I'm there a lot. I was there a lot. One day, I had my husband and we had company from out of town come in. And she was in the exhibit hall. We were in the exhibit hall. And she happened to walk through. And I said, Donna, they have questions I can't answer. She has never shut up since. I, I, don't, I said, oh my God, if I had known 10 years ago, I could have said to, I could have got her talking just by asking her a question on something that she knew. So it, now we're friends. <laughs> we have been. So that's not part of my, but I just wanted to tell you a little bit about her. She was very shy. She just did her work. She went back and forth and didn't, she did her own thing. And that, that was Donna. Um, as you know, because Mark told you, um, Jean Brady, I've been with the Guild for 25 years. I have to say that um, I hadn't planned on being here this long, but I, I love it, and that's why I'm still here. The first thing I have to say, where's Valerie? There she is. The first thing is sweet Valerie called me, emailed me, and I told her I was going to say this story. She said, Jean, what do you need? I said, I need a glass of water and a glass of wine. Do you see the wine? So that's the first thing, Valerie. Um, the second thing that I really kind of had to say was how I got to be a member of the Guild. When we first, when my husband and I were retired, we moved here to Boulder City and lived at a, with a double wide down at the lake, which was fine because we had an RV and we traveled in the summer. We decided the double wide wouldn't work. That 800 square foot was just not good enough for both of us to live in together. So we bought a house and it was really land on Appaloosa, so right kind of behind the museum off of Equestrian. And when we, were, we got it bare, I mean, we basically watched it being built, and my husband was handy. So um, we were painting, we were changing doors, we did a lot of stuff. A friend of ours that we had met by the name of um, Natalie Wilkie, which is, I probably, several of you know Ray and Natalie, because they're one of those people that have been here forever. She called me one day and she said, I, I'm going to introduce you to some people at the museum. And I said, okay, fine. She said, there's a luncheon. I want you to come to the luncheon. Okay, fine. Came time to introduce me. She stood up and said, this is Jean Brady, and she has nothing to do. So she'd be, <laughs> <laughs> she would be good to have on, and on, you know, part of a membership. I had no idea, and this is, now we really get into it. I had no idea what a social club, basically, the guild was at that point. It was, it was considered basically a sorority. There really were no men to speak of that, that was a member. Um, to give you an idea, this is what they had for back, I don't, you'll have to come up and look sometime too, but it's basically what I call the pink lady. And the pink lady was the symbol of the Clark County Museum Guild. Like, really? So you can tell that was a female-oriented group. Um, so that's, that's basically how I got to be a member, because I didn't have anything to do. I didn't dare tell my husband that at the time, because he thought I did. Uh, they basically did raise money, but they raised money on their own social events. 
And the reason how I, I know is because Lois Taylor was the president when I joined. And she said, Jean, I want you to be the fundraiser. Okay, don't know what I'm doing, but that's, that sounds good. So the, one of the first things we did was hold a dinner social event out at the museum along Heritage Street. Now, I thought this is gonna be a great thing to do. What I found out is they only sold tickets to themselves. I said, everybody, I said, how many did you sell? Oh, well, we, we sold, we had a friend and they didn't sell any tickets to anybody else but themselves. They were that social with their own group. So it took me a little while to understand that and what I needed to do to get it a little bit better. Um, and we finally started doing a few things that, that worked. I mean, far, they would never have any meetings at the museum either. If you went, had your meetings, it was out at lunch somewhere. They didn't believe in using the guild too much. I mean, the depot. I mean, they did use it a little bit, but they, they rarely used it. It was lunch out. Every time you had a meeting, that's where you went. Um, when they did something like um, the progressive dinner, they went to them, they sold tickets to themselves again and they went from house to house to house. Um, when they did installation of the officers, we, they went to a house. When they did a Christmas party, they went to another member's house. So it was a real social group. Um, they made a big mistake because they asked me to run for president a couple years after I had been there. But before that, still being a fundraiser person, I have to tell you, um, I went away to watch my first grandbaby come into this world, and I came back a couple weeks later, and we had already planned on being part of the Heritage Street or Industrial Days Parade. When I came back, they informed me after I had worked with people that um, we weren't going to do it. And I said, what do you mean we're not going to do it? I've already made arrangements with the city of Henderson and, you know, industrial raid that we would be part of this. They said, well, we didn't know what you were going to do and it's too much work, so we were not going to do it. So I immediately wrote a letter and resigned from the guild. Um, and it was towards the end because we go from July to June. So it was towards the end of that time, right around the industrial days time. And, um, and I didn't go to the museum for the next couple of months. Well, all of a sudden I get called up and said, Jean, you know, when are you going to come back in? And I said, I'm not a member. And they said, oh, yeah, you are. Somebody paid for you. So that's why I'm consecutive member for 25 years, because I tried not to be. But, and I still, to this day, don't know who paid for me. I have an idea. I think it was Judy Hampton, but she would never fess up that she did. Um, probably before, I was just trying to see. I have notes. I cannot speak spontaneously, but the first thing Mark said to me when I said, I don't know the history. So the first thing I have to tell you is this is 10 years of history. We found this book a couple years ago hidden that I didn't even know it was in the back of the Goumont house because the guild has stuff everywhere. Um, so if anybody wants to come up and take a look at the biggest album I've ever seen in my entire life, um, Heavy, if you know names and you know people back then, and they're not on there, please tell me who they are and we'll put a sticky on them or come visit me sometime at the museum and we'll kind of make fill this out with names because it's not. Um, because that was the other thing they did is they all kept, they all, because they didn't have an office or anything, they all kept the records to themselves. So when people changed from one office to another, depending if you're not you're president or secretary or not all the records maybe went with you because, you know, depending on who you gave them to and when that person passed or when that person moved away. So some of our history is not, it's, it's missing some gaps. Um, but this is a pretty good, pretty good record of who was who and what was what. Um, we were lucky that eventually when the new building got back where the offices are, then they gave us a guild office. Uh, of course, there was a time we couldn't call it a guild office because of who was ahead of the county at the time, Parks and Rec, but that's always been the guild office, so at least we had something. Then we got to move shelving into the depot, so we kept started keeping stuff in there. Um, so we have a lot of stuff now, fortunately or unfortunately how it is. Um, 
but like I said, before 1994, um, they held things out. After that, we really started using the museum itself to be the basis of why people would come and hold events. Um, when they had, we had Native American, the museum guild sold water and popcorn. Woohoo! But, but we made money. That's what we did. Um, then one year I decided that with all these houses, wouldn't it be fun to do a Halloween event out here? And that's how our Halloween event started for nine years. And we started off with like three hours one night, and all I wanted to do is make sure we broke even. We made $500, so I thought, this is cool. And we eventually moved, it ended up being a three-night event that took 100 people a night to run because of all the stuff that we had. And, and it kind of got overwhelming. And so between what happened with Mark losing people with being cuts and me just being tired and nobody wanted to take my place, it went away. So I went from trick-or-treating for kids, I went to a poker tournament for the adults. It's all games, so um, that's our big fundraiser now that we're doing. Mark mentioned that um, we had raised $250,000, which we did recently, to finally get the building done, the GCA building started and done. We've signed the paperwork, we've got our contractors, so we're on to that. But now that money is raised, we are, our next project actually is getting the shelving for the new storage building. So that's my, that's my push for the next couple of years, at least while I'm still around for I retire, um, is to go on that. So it's, it's basically my theme for that is saving history one row at a time, meaning a row of the specialized shelving, which costs about $25,000 a row. So... We'll do what we can and what they'll do. And, and if anybody wants to come to the poker tournament, I'll tell you all the information you need to know. Um, I really, I've been president, as Mark said, three times. I was um, the 18th president. I happen to be the 23rd president. And now I'm the 26th president. Um, they can't get rid of me, but they will shortly because I'm going to retire. <laughs> Um, but I love it. I love the museum. I love working with these two people up here. Mark and I make a pretty good team. He is not my boss. And sometimes I have to remind him of that. Um, like when he said, Gene, what are you doing the 27th of March? And I said, I don't know. He said, well, you're actually speaking. And I said, no, I'm not. And he said, yeah, you are. Um, again, I have to remind you that I'm, you know, we work together, not for you. But so that really, that's all I have to say right now. Okay. Thank you. I just, I just like helping people coming out of their shells. Um, I, I do have to say that uh, one of the things that Donna told me when I was um, first dealing with all of the television work not the Pawn Stars per se, but I also do a monthly piece on CCTV, the, the cable access. Um, Donna was adamant. She was never, ever going to show up on one of those. She did four of them, I think, for me. Um, you know, I'm, I'm always there for helping people break out of their shells. Um, Yes, and she has. And, and tonight's panel, um, when the uh, Henderson Historical Society accepted my, my suggestion of this as a topic area, because I thought this was a good topic, and since it was our, our 50th anniversary last, last year, my first thought was this particular panel, and um, I was helping them break out of their shells. You know, I'm not, I didn't order them, I just helped them along. I didn't, no, I, I didn't take no, um, but I was merely helping them. And I, I thank both of them for being here tonight. Um, do you have any questions? Yes, ma'am.
not the Beckley House. Everyone referred to it as the Beckley Mansion because everyone in Edmonton was living in one story in your townhouse or what we call track two homes. So a two story house, that's the Beckley Mansion. <laughs> the other thing is, one of, um, on one of our trips up to the museum, we had a building off to the right that looked like a pool house. In it. Ah, yes. That was torn down. That was moved to the site actually by the guild, the guild building, the one that was by the out, out, uh, by the parking lot. That that was a building that was given to the museum, uh, and the guild was working on that. The guild was working with uh, Parks and Recreation, and it was going to be a structure that was going to be restored and used as a building that we could have um, educational programming and that sort of thing in. But it turned out, one of the things that you have to understand about the museum is that the museum got started before there was city sewer in that area. If we do a building there that has water to it, we have to put the entire site on city sewer. That adds two and a half million dollars to any project that we do. That particular structure would have had water to it, a, a bathroom, and would have meant a, a project that would have been way too much money. The county was not willing to put the money into it, and the building was just not worth it. So it ended up being one that it was not worth restoring, and so it was torn down uh, rather than trying to restore it. Um, unfortunately, sometimes you run into problems like that. The building that we're going to be building now, the storage building, will not have any offices in it, no bathrooms. It is just a storage building. It will have a sprinkler system but that doesn't trigger the same kinds of requirements. And that's just one of the realities. We have three septics on the site. We're fine with that, city's fine with that. But if we do anything else, we will have to deal with that in the future. Thankfully, since I'm looking at retiring next year, it'll be somebody else's problem. So I don't have to worry about that one. But that's what it was. Any other questions? Yes. Did you recognize the footprints in the Beckley Mansion? Did Did I personally recognize it? Could you say <laughs> some my okay. You know, I always said it was Mrs. Beckley, uh, only because she was the one that lived there the longest. <coughs> and I mean, a lot of everybody always poo poos the whole thing, but. I can only say what I saw when I go in there in the morning. And I mean, it was very obvious. I mean, it was indented at least this far. And you'd lock it up at night, nobody else was in there, and you'd go in the morning, and that spot was there every morning. <laughs> so. You need to use your, your microphone when you're, when you're answering the questions as you speak. <laughs> Uh, yeah. One of my all-time favorite museum guild things was the cookbook that you did. Yes. And it was, what, is it 20 years ago? Well, I didn't do it. It was before me. But it's a cookbook. It's a very large mm -hmm. cookbook. Right. The illustrations were actually done by Lynn Starr. I know. And vintage pictures of old Henderson. Mm -hmm. And in addition to recipes that were kind of um, popular in the 40s and 50s in, in Henderson, a lot of the pioneer ladies put little articles about how Henderson was when they first arrived. Well, or, or hints. They did hints. two things. They were hints and how to do something. But yeah, then... Have you ever thought of republishing? I know it's a real big one. Have you ever thought of republishing that or publishing parts of it? I, it's fascinating not only for the recipes of the time, but also the stories of the Actually, what we thought about doing, and Joan Tinker's sitting there too, we really thought about recreating them and having a party out there with some of the recipes is what we thought, and then give copies of that recipe for the meals that we were having. That was, we were, we were going in that direction. I don't, I don't know what happened to us, but we didn't, we didn't finish. I think part of a, 
we did get close. We thought, you know, Emery was going to be one of the cooks. We, Joan had gone around and lined up several chefs for us, and that's what we thought we would do with it. So it's not out of our minds. It's just, um, it's just something that's there for somebody else to maybe come in and take over. Um, because we, I love the book, too, and I didn't even know we had any left until Donna told me once, oh, yeah, there's a whole box of them sitting in the depot. Remember that? Because I didn't think we had any left. People talked about them. Um, but I didn't have one until she said there was some left. They okay. went, they went, they bought them a couple different times to sell. So, okay. And if you're interested in becoming involved with the Guild, you can join. The Guild has memberships available. We'd love to have you join the Guild. Men and women. Yep. It's not ladies only now. It's not ladies only. Uh, it's not the pink lady anymore. Nope. Um, and in fact, the guild just this week um, Monday went to the uh, test site on a tour. Um, nowadays, once a year, they do a uh, tour to some historic uh, area in the county. Um, they do a lot more now than they used to do. So it's, it's a very active organization, but as you know, they do still raise money. I'm very happy about that part, I must admit, but they do quite a bit of, of work, and I'm sure Jean would be very happy to talk with you, take your name, get you an application form, and trust me, application is you fill out your name and address, that sort of thing, and give her money. She's happy. She's happy. <laughs> you know, doesn't, doesn't mean you have to have any, you know, you don't have to have lived here multiple generations, any of that sort of thing. So, any other questions? All right. Thank you all for coming. We do appreciate it. I believe the next one will be on the Three Kids Mine, is it not? All right. That should be an interesting one. Thank you all for coming. We have some refreshments out in the uh, foyer.